good morning everyone uh, today i'll be just uh, brushing upon uh, recent advances which have happened in uh, portal hypertension but uh, by main concentration will be uh, mainly upon uh, extra hepatic portal and obstruction for that reason that this is the most commonest cause in children which we uh, encounter day to day and uh, of course uh, this is one interesting disease which always fascinates me because this is this uh, this is has uh, taken a long journey from uh, what was an initial treatment and to now what is called as a cure with the advent of uh, mesorex uh, bypass now the initial management of uh, portal hypertension was uh, mainly regarding the management of uh, complications uh, mainly varicell bleeding which is uh, very well known to all and along with that uh, hypersplenism uh, portal biliopathy growth retardation and uh, mild hepatic uh, encephalopathy but now the trends are changing in that uh, overall it's more like a uh, comprehensive management rather than only management of uh, varicell bleeding the focus is shifting it's uh, shifting to the management of other complications rather than only the management of uh, varicell uh, bleed now i would like to highlight upon uh, this uh, particular reason uh, which is known to be uh, one of the causative factor for uh, portal vein thrombosis especially in uh, pediatrics initially it was states that uh, a lot of thrombophilic uh, states which exist in children are known to be the causative factor for uh, portal vein thrombosis but uh, recent uh, theories have refuted disputed this and there have been studies which show that uh, it's mainly the low hepatic blood flow which is uh, responsible for low anticoagulant protein synthesis by the liver especially in children with uh, ehpvo and it's not a primary uh, condition which is associated with this and uh, it has been also seen that after conventional shunt surgery the level of anticoagulant proteins tend to go down further because you are further diverting the blood away from the liver whereas the level of these proteins are known to improve following a uh, rex shunt and uh, regarding the role of uh, anticoagulation as such in uh, ehpo yes it is indicated especially when there is acute thrombosis of the portal vein so you initially start off with uh, low molecular weight heparin and uh, replace it with oral anticoagulant therapy and that is to be continued for at least 6 months and especially when there is chronic ehpvo anticoagulant therapy is mandatory when you have a documented pro thrombotic state that is genetically uh, a thrombophilic state like protein c or protein s deficiency and uh, it should always be borne in mind that anticoagulation in these patients should be instituted only when you have taken care of the underlying uh, causes like especially varicell bleed prophylaxis has been uh, initiated otherwise it can lead to troublesome bleeding now uh, going ahead of a step further uh, there are studies which uh, were evaluating whether we could predict varices without a role of endoscopy now why this question arises was endoscopy is one uh, procedure especially in young children requiring uh, anesthesia and it's not a one time procedure there are multiple sessions of endoscopy is required in these patients to eradicate varices and uh, multiple sessions means multiple anesthesias and the risk of neurocognitive development now these studies evaluated uh, that there was few factors which can predict whether these patients will have high risk of uh, varices now the main thing was uh, presence of uh, thickened gall bladder wall or peri uh, cholecystic varices and uh, tissue elastography that is to assess the strength of the tissue uh, the presence of liver and spleen stiffness now this was one important factor which has been associated with the uh, presence of varices and they have seen that uh, stiff spleen the spleen size and the platelet counts are uh, better predictor of uh, varices in children and these are the one subset of children which you can subject them to an endoscopy rather than uh, other children and regarding uh, varicell prophylaxis the role of uh, beta blockers in children as known is uh, again disputable and it's presently there is no recommended evidence uh, to start beta blockers in uh, these children as uh, primary prophylaxis and again secondary prophylaxis in adults they have seen recently that carvedilol is more effective than propranolol or nedolol but again uh, use in children not uh, recommended and uh, regarding the role of uh, sclerotherapy and uh, ligation of varices for uh, primary prophylaxis that is even before a bleed has occurred now what do you recommend now it has been seen that when you rec- when you uh, subject these children for uh, primary prophylaxis that is when you primarily ligate or band the varices it has been seen that they develop uh, gastric varices more early than uh, compared to the control population and uh, it is well is difficult to control the bleed from uh, gastric varices hence uh, primary prophylaxis with uh, sclerotherapy or varicell ligation is not recommended for asymptomatic children however they should be on surveillance uh, endoscopy and there are few exceptions to this rule that is 
especially when these children have uh, large viruses with uh, bleeding indicators that is uh, topical red spots or in the child has got a rare blood group or they are from remote places without access to emergency care. Now those are the group of patients wherein you can recommend uh, primary prophylaxis for uh, viruses. Now the management of bleeding as such has undergone a drastic change and uh, as we know uh, EVL that is uh, variceal uh, ligation has uh, scored better over uh, in, uh, sclerotherapy. But uh, there are uh, studies now which are upcoming saying that a combination of varicell ligation with sclerotherapy is better than either of them alone. Now <coughs> the fact lies in the, this one that the varicell ligation will uh, take care of the larger varices which will further reduce the dose of uh, sclerotherapy which is required for this so that the complications associated with sclerotherapy is not seen in these patients. And these children require a fewer sessions they will have less complications and the recurrence rates are also less in these patients. And uh, in an acute emergency blade when you have no uh, access to a variceal ligator or especially in young children wherein it is uh, difficult to pass on a band ligator across a narrow cricopharynx, now this device that is a uh, topical hemostat spray can help in uh, acute condition, I mean control of uh, bleed till you can uh, handle them definitely. Now, <coughs> Coming to portal cavernoma uh, cholangiopathy, now this terminology has been uh, given up, I mean taken up uh, than the older uh, terminology that is uh, portal biliopathy. Now it can be either symptomatic or asymptomatic and the theory is being both ischemia and then uh, compression theory and the uh, diagnosis is usually with MRC and unless and until there is an intervention indicated ERC is indicated otherwise ERC is known to have complications especially bleeding because of uh, abnormal viruses in this region. And uh, <coughs> The treatment advocates for these conditions indicate that asymptomatic patients uh, can undergo primary shunt surgery uh, without any definitive management of biliopathy because following shunt surgery the biliopathy is known to resolve by itself and if they are symptomatic then a primary endotherapy is indicated that is ERC ind indicated for these patients before you contemplate a definitive portal uh, um, hypertensive surgery and uh, once you uh, treat these patients for uh, <coughs> shunt surgery, if there is persistence of biliopathy then you need to document that uh, the shunt is patent and the viruses around the cholodocus as resolved before you incomplete a uh, surgery for these patients. Uh, this is an MRI picture uh, which depicts two kinds of uh, uh, biliopathy changes. The first picture uh, shows uh, the varicot type of uh, cavernoma which shows uh, segmental dilatations of uh, CBD and the second picture shows a fibrotic variety. Now what is so important about this? Now the important lines in the clinical significance that the fibrotic variety of uh, portal uh, cavernoma cholangiopathy is usually non-reversible and uh, these are the patients which require a separate surgery for their uh, biliary tract obstruction. Now growth retardation is very commonly encountered in these patients and uh, the initial theory which was proposed regarding this was portal entropathy and uh, later on people came up with uh, growth hormone resistance uh, because of low levels of uh, insulin like growth factor 1 and insulin growth factor binding protein 3. And uh, people have also seen that there is catch up growth which is uh, seen after uh, especially uh, mesorex bypass when compared to other conventional portosystemic shunt surgeries. Now this is one landmark uh, surgery latestly published which has uh, <coughs> uh, studied uh, the metabolic profile of uh, children uh, who are undergoing mesorex bypass and they saw that the difference in stool calorie losses, uh, it was not uh, significantly different either before surgery or after surgery, uh, refuting the hypothesis of uh, portal entropathy as the primary uh, cause for uh, growth retardation. And uh, they also saw that the levels of pre-albumin and insulin-like growth factor has improved following uh, mesorex bypass. So supporting that uh, the growth hormone resistance could be the primary reason. Uh, hepatic encephalopathy in these patients is usually of the mild variety and the significance, um, and, uh, the incidence is quite alarming. That's about uh, 25 to 40 percent. Now, <coughs> till late, uh, we didn't have any objective method of assessment of uh, hepatic encephalopathy in these patients. Now, whatever uh, the neuropsychological tests were available in these patients was only subjective. Now, of late, we have a protein, I mean, proton uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy which has emerged as an objective method of uh, assessment. Now it mainly analyzes the metabolites in uh, these uh, patients brain uh, especially these three that is glutamate, myoinositol and uh, choline. Now increased levels of uh, glutamate can be seen in any kind of uh, liver failure whereas the other two metabolites are most important uh, that is uh, myoinositol and uh, normal choline. 
Now, in children uh, with uh, EHPVO, it has been seen that the levels of myoinositol are low and the choline levels are normal. Whereas in adults, as the disease progresses, the levels of myoinositol decreases and the choline levels are normal. Whereas in cirrhosis, uh, <coughs> the choline levels are uh, reduced. Now, a gold standard uh, radiological investigation which has uh, stood the test of time is uh, transjugular uh, portovenography. But however, because of its uh, invasive nature, uh, it's not routinely performed and routinely what we employ is um, a color Doppler ultrasonogram or a CT and a MR angiogram. Now, there are studies which say that uh, MR angiogram or a CT angiogram are not 100% sensitive or specific in identifying the patent intrahepatic uh, portal tree, especially when you're uh, planning for a erection. So a poor visualization of uh, the left portal vein by these techniques is uh, not taken as a contraindication for an attempted uh, REX shunt. So any patient with EHPO, there is no contraindication to attempt a REX just because you are not seeing the portal vein on this uh, imaging. So ideally, you need to do an intraop uh, transjugular portovenography to assess whether the left uh, vein is patent. And uh, there are few radiological interventions which can be uh, useful in these uh, patients, that is measurement of uh, uh, pressure or flow velocity at shunt which can indicate uh, shunt uh, stenosis uh, and whenever a shunt is stenosed uh, you can use a balloon venoplasty or a cutting balloon venoplasty, thrombectomy or a stent placement across these uh, shunts and now uh, tips for EHPO is emerging, I will be highlighting it in the next few slides and um, for uh, uncontrolled uh, hypersplenism, uh, a patient who is not fit for surgery you can even contemplate a partial splenic vessel uh, embolization or uh, <coughs> If the patient develops in splenic artery aneurysm because of hyperdynamic circulation, you may even use uh, aneurysm coil embolization of the splenic artery. And uh, of course, uh, percutaneous uh, transhepatic uh, biliary drainage when there is uh, obstruction of the bile duct. Now, this is, uh, of course, a recent advancement in uh, management of uh, these patients. Now, earlier when we spoke about tips in portal hypertension, the first thing which used to come to our mind was that uh, tips was a bridge for liver transplant. Now, People have uh, further advanced in these techniques and they have uh, seen whether tips can be used in patients with EHPVO. Of course, there are stringent criteria for uh, these, that is patient selection criteria is uh, very, very uh, strict and uh, three approaches have been uh, used in these two uh, studies, that is transjugular, uh, transhepatic and uh, transsplenic and uh, they have seen that the feasibility of uh, this procedure has been uh, uh, affected by the extent of uh, portal vein occlusion and uh, a presence of uh, left uh, portal vein which was patent has increased, uh, uh, um, what is it, it has uh, made the uh, procedure more easy. Now three important factors which uh, determine the role of uh, tips in EHPVO are one, uh, targeting a landing site that is a patent uh, part of the portal vein if it is uh, present and crossing or negotiating your guideware across the thrombosed uh, portion of the portal vein and to uh, maintain sufficient blood flow. Now, uh, many studies advocate early shunt surgery because the ability of the portal venous system to adapt is uh, age dependent and it has been seen that irreversible changes uh, happen in these uh, patients if you delay the surgery which can lead to reduced blood flow if the shunt is done late. Now, there are uh, several criteria which has been laid down at the Bevan 6 consensus and especially the most important one is 5PA venous anatomy which uh, means a patent left and uh, right uh, portal vein. So, you need to have a patient uh, uh, superior mesenteric vein, a splenic vein and a patent bilateral IJV and the success also depends upon the weight of the child that is uh, more than 8 kg. With all these factors taken into consideration, you can meet a success rate up to more than 90%. Now the choice of graft, again uh, IJV has uh, stood the test of time and it has been recommended as the best graft for uh, erection. Now this study has uh, evaluated uh, the differences uh, in outcomes after uh, portosystemic shunt surgery and uh, erection and it has been seen that uh, patients who underwent erection did not have any further bleed episodes over a period of 4.5 years with improved uh, INR and uh, serum ammonia levels, improved growth parameters. Now the main highlights which I would like to offer at the end of this conclusion is that endotherapy as a primary treatment for uh, EHPVO that is control of variceal bleed is no longer valid and uh, you should also consider the other associated complications of uh, portal hypertension that is EHPVO when you are contemplating surgery in these uh, patients. 
and uh, children with EHPO should be soon evaluated for a possible mesorex bypass as soon as you diagnose them and early surgery always has a better outcome and uh, mesorex bypass of course will have a better outcome over uh, conventional portosystemic shunt surgery. And uh, radiology as such in EHPO is not only diagnostic anymore and it's also emerging as a therapeutic modality. Thank you, Dr. Murali. Uh, you touched upon a difficult topic, and um, it's important, uh, being a pediatric surgeon, all of us should know the management of uh, upper J bleed. It's an emergency most of the time. And uh, you touched upon the role of anticoagulants and the predictors of viruses, the recent advances involved. So most of the recent advances you have covered. So the topic is open for discussion. I want PGs to participate in the discussion because most of these topics are, uh, you know, planned, uh, keeping you in mind. So please participate in the discussion. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Murli. I'm Dr. Nagendra. I'll be next speaker. So the most important question which lies with the uh, portal cavernoma or uh, EHO is timing of surgery. Actually, there are so many studies, basically from the developing world, because this is largely a disease of uh, developing world. It's not much seen in developed world as compared to our uh, uh, area. Yes. So there are some studies which have looked upon when should we look for surgery in case of asymptomatic portal cholangiopathy. So should we, uh, most of the studies, like studies from uh, SGPJ and all, they have shown it's a time duration and uh, thrombosis of the SMV, they are more prone to develop uh, portal cavernomatous cholangiopathy and even uh, the predictors of portal colopathy is again long-standing disease and eradicated varices. So, I mean just eradicating the varices and otherwise child is fine, my, uh, small, uh, some four, five centimeters of the spleen and not much symptomatic hypersplenism. The question lies is when should we offer the surgery? And with the availability of mesorex bypass, I think uh, more and more cases should be taken up for the surgery. So largely when I refer the cases for surgeons, the most uh, important debate is when should we offer the surgery? That is the most important debate. So with your talk, at least one thing has been clear that uh, mesorex bypass should be offered very early. Yeah. I mean even for the primary prophylaxis, it's been recommended. So when should, uh, like in case of asymptomatic biliopathy, we is there any consensus regarding uh, excuse, bypass surgery? Excuse me, surgery? Uh, you know, if, if, if the question was timing of surgery. Timing I of think surgery. the speaker has addressed that question. Yeah. He has advocated an earlier uh, intervention because of the various comprehensive treatment that you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So uh, apart from mesorex bypass, if mesorex bypass is not possible, then when should we uh, contemplate the surgery? That is your question. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Sanjay, would you like to make a comment on the mesorex bypass since it's... No, I think I should congratulate you on a very, very nice and very, very comprehensive presentation. I think it was crisp. It had all the references quoted on the presentation. Thank you. And sir. I think you covered a lot of ground in a very lucid manner. I think... Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think I agree entirely with all that you said. Almost everything that you said, I think I agree with. Uh, we are not doing HVPG. It is too invasive a test yeah. in the small child. Yeah. You can use carbon dioxide, vinography, yeah. but all those things are things that are technically possible, but probably not practical on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Uh, I would suggest, I mean, I would agree with what you say. Once you have a patient with portal hypertension, if there is a serious reason where you have to do splenectomy, then yes, you try for a central shunt if you have symptomatic splenomegaly. If not, then try and see if you can do a bypass and your patients probably will do better in the long run. That's at least the current literature or current evidence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir.